Amen. The sermon text this morning is 2 Timothy 1, verses 1 through 7. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, dwells in you as well. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. We've all heard the uh, expression, someone's kind of just burnt out, right? It's a term that probably wasn't used more than 30 years ago, but we use it now. You know, someone is burned out. You know, in the medical community, they're burned out from working with patients in sickness or <clears throat> in the educational community. They're burned out from the difficulties of teaching. In the pastoral ministry, you have burnout. At the end of 2022, <clears throat> Barna did research, Barna Research Group, it's a Christian group, found that 42% of those who were pastoring wanted to quit. They were just burned out. Part of it was COVID and all the issues related to that. But, but it's more than just that. And Duke University did a, a survey that found that uh, all those men who have come out of seminary, only 85% are still in ministry after five years. Only 10% <clears throat> make it ministry until their retirement. But it's not just the numbers. I was on the phone with an intern, a former intern, uh, within the past month, and he said, I feel like quitting twice a week. You know, just the difficulties, the hardship, the conflict, all the work that's done, uh, we face burnout. But it's not just at the pastoral level, it's at the, also at the people. I mean, you walking out the Christian life in this day and age with the headwinds that you're facing, I mean, it's difficult. It's, it's hard to be persevering and to be found faithful. Remember now, persevering isn't just getting by, but it's growing in the faith. And you all struggle in the same way. It's hard to be found faithful regularly, always in the word, trying to be, you know, walking with integrity and honesty. So, so it's, it's a difficulty that we all face to persevere. This is really what Paul's second letter to Timothy is about. Now, Timothy, uh, Paul is trying to encourage Timothy to finish well, to persevere, and to be strong. Uh, it's like a handing of the baton. It's a passing of the baton. Now, you may ask, well, why is Timothy in such need of encouragement? Well, remember, Timothy, if you remember back last year, we did 1 Timothy. Uh, so last year, Paul sent Timothy, a young protege, to help the church in Ephesus, uh, this church was in a cosmopolitan city, very large city. And he was young, <clears throat> and he was facing all kinds of issues. Uh, but, and Paul sent him to put the things in order. That's what it says in chapter 3 of 1 Timothy. In other words, to appoint deacons, to appoint elders, to confront false teachers, uh, to begin to get the church functioning as the church ought to be, kind of a display of God's glory. Now, he did do that, but it came at a toll. Timothy was wavering in faith, struggling, and we're going to see it through this letter. He, he was fighting for faith. Now, Timothy's facing more than just that. He's facing opposition from Rome. Uh, the false teachers were still there in the church, as we're going to find in this letter. Uh, not just that, the Timothy was, as we learned last year, was kind of timid. He was shy. He, he's more of an introvert, perhaps, and uh, given to becoming easy, easy to become sick. But even more, Timothy knew that Paul was most likely uh, going to die soon. He was in this place built in 640 B.C. 
Mamertine prison. It was called the House of Darkness because it was a prison and it was underground with just one hole at the top to allow air and light in. And it would be a place that most did not leave except through death. And so here Paul is writing this letter from prison trying to encourage Timothy, you've got to persevere. You've got to finish strong. The irony, of course, is obvious. He's in prison suffering and yet giving encouragement to the one who is not in prison. Now, Paul would die in a few years. In fact, he says in chapter 4, we're going to see this, he says that I'm already poured out like a drink offering. I know that the time of my departure has come. So Paul knows it. He knows it's at the end. This is like a shifting of the apostolic air, Paul being an apostle, to the pastoral air. Timothy was not an apostle. He was a pastor. And so there's a major shift in Paul saying, continue on, press on, persevere in spite of the difficulty. And that's what we're going to see throughout this whole letter. It's a beautiful letter. You see it in Timothy when he says, my dearly loved child. I mean, can't you feel it? That, that, that spiritual fathering to the son who's now going to take the baton and move on? And, and, and you, you know, as a parent, you just want your children to continue on in faith. I mean, you, you, can, heal the, you can hear the heartbeat. So there's three ways that we're going to see in our passage that he kind of encourages them. First, he wants Timothy to remember the unique nature of the gospel. Remember the unique nature, the divine nature. The gospel that we sing about and hear about, folks, it is not an invention of men and women. It it is clearly from God. Nobody would think this up on their own. Uh, Secondly, he wants Timothy to remember God's workers. Look at the people in Timothy's life. He's going to reference himself and his mother and his grandmother. God appoints people in our lives to help us persevere. We can't do it alone. And then third, he wants him to remember God's spirit. Uh, God's spirit, this you know, fan into flame. We need God's spirit to move forward. So three things, it's God's unique gospel and uh, God's workers, the people in our lives, and then ultimately God's spirit. So let's look at each one. Let's first look at the unique gospel. Look with me back at one and two again. If you would, he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, from God the Father in in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, look at this with me. You you might be struck. It's kind of strange. Here, this is a, a letter for the church, no doubt. Ultimately, it would be. And I say that because at the end of the gospel, Paul says you in plural. He uses the plural, meaning for the church. But clearly, first and foremost, it's a personal letter. It's Timothy, it's Paul to Timothy. If it's a personal letter, why is Paul so formal with identifying himself? They had been together for as many as 15 years. So why the formality? Why Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God? Why that? And it's not like Timothy didn't know it. I I would just, you know, a lot of liberal scholars actually think this is why they would argue Paul didn't write the letter. You know, Paul wouldn't identify himself in this way to Timothy. It was a personal letter. And they they think it was some later editor, maybe 100 AD, uh, that would bring about, you know, the compiling of this letter. I say, I don't think so. I think what Paul's doing is he's reminding Timothy from prison. No, no, no. I mean, note the irony here again. Paul saying, no, I am an apostle. Paul, you're in prison. He's in the full employment of God. He's confident in God's sovereignty. I'm an apostle of Christ Jesus right where I am by the will of God. In other words, Paul wasn't, Paul speaking about his apostleship. Apostle just means to be sent, to be sent with a message. Paul sees himself as being sent with a message by God himself. Paul didn't seek to be an apostle. He didn't volunteer for it. He didn't get the stripes on his arm to earn it. No, God summoned him. God said, no, by the God, God says, Paul, you will be an apostle. You can read about it in Acts chapter 9. Paul's going to persecute the church, and God says, nope, we're going this way. 
And boom, he goes the other way. I mean, it was by the will of God that Paul is caught. And I think Paul is telling Timothy, this message that we have is not simply human wisdom or how to give you a better you. This is a divine message from God that's meant to save. And so he's reminding Timothy, don't lag in faith. What we have is a message of life. Notice what it says. He's an apostle by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. Notice that. We pass over introductions. I pass over introductions all the time. I don't stop and kind of mine it for the details. Paul is saying here that he's been called to be an apostle of God to preach this promise of life, the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. That's the message that he is passing on to Timothy to preach. A promise of life. What does that mean? Well, folks, we're dying. It's a promise of life. God is speaking to dying people about life. Life now, Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and life to the full, both life now and life to come. Think with me back in Genesis chapter 3. After the sin, they're separated from God. They're moved out of the garden. What begins to form? Death, right? You now will die. And so to a people facing death, we have a promise of life. I mean, friends, this is incredible. I mean, as we age to see a promise of life, a, a, a life that's marked by forgiveness and reconciliation, being brought together with God, every day, we just realize people are dying, they're dying, they're, and here we have a promise of life. But he explains it even further. Uh, notice in verse 2, after he, he just affectionately speaks to Timothy as his dearly loved child, he said, grace and mercy and peace be to you. These are gospel terms. This is describing the life, the promise of life that he's given to us. I mean, grace, you know what that means. It means this, un, this um, favor that's unearned. God has been kind to us to give us a savior. I mean, God could have, he could have done nothing to save a people who walked away from him. He's moved with a unilateral love, but not just grace, mercy. <clears throat> mercy is not getting something you deserve. We have received pardon through faith in Christ, the forgiveness of our sins, peace, uh, peace is that idea of, of what was once ruptured in a relationship between the creator and the creation has now been rectified and resolved in Christ. So you hear grace and mercy. Uh, friends, these are pregnant terms. If you're weighed down with sin, to know mercy, that's big. I mean, to be at odds with someone that you need to live and to have it reconciled, that's peace. I mean, to have something given to you that, that you did not deserve at all, that's just grace. I mean, they're, they're beautiful terms. And, and so here, Paul is just reminding Timothy. He's motivating him. He's saying to him, consider the nature of the gospel. I mean, it's divine. It's unique. We have the promise of life to a people, to a people who are so vulnerable that we need each breath to live. He gives us life. Now, why doesn't that motivate us to persevere more? I mean, when we hit the skids and we begin to get burned out on the faith, we begin to kind of trail out, we fatigue, why doesn't this motivate us? I mean, wh one reason could be our lives are good now, right? I, I mean, we have nice lives. We get to do things. We have plenty of food. We have good conditions in which we live. We have friendships. I mean, I mean we have nice lives now. And, and these nice lives can often, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying it can be a distracting thing to really make much of the promise of life. I mean, think about this, uh, just to draw an analogy. Teeth, right? Teeth are needed to speak. They're needed to, to help form words as air comes out of your mouth. They're needed to eat. I mean, I mean teeth are essential for our lives. We never think about it. We never think about your teeth. You don't even feel your teeth. But when you do, and you get a toothache, you're all about your teeth. You know, it, it's kind of like this promise of life. We don't think about it until we get that note that says, yeah, I got a lot. 
you have a lump. Or there's a shadow on the mammogram. Or you get a call from the doctor. Or you don't feel good. And then all of a sudden, what do we start doing? We start thinking about this promise of life. We want to be wise people. Wise people think ahead. We plan. We consider. Uh, We want to remember our own brevity. We're like the grass, here today and gone tomorrow. In Psalm 90, the psalmist says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Folks, we have to be intentional about this. Carol and I in the spring, some of you know this, we were able to go to Hawaii for for a little bit of time. And we walked through this town called Lahaina. Uh, Lahaina is a beautiful town. It's the ancient capital of Maui, of, of actually the Hawaiian Islands. It's on Maui. And, um, and you know the raging fires there? Whole town's gone. Whole town's gone. I mean, not one building. Uh, Carol and I, just six months ago, were walking through. We had dinner there. Bought some of the, uh, some of the grandkids' gifts there. I had appetizers there, right there on Front Street, all the buildings. They have these unique trees. It's all gone. Not just as their loss of life, but, but there's the loss of lives. People live their lives there. And just boom, one day, it's all gone. And, and it, it's a reminder to us not to first say, oh, thank, thank you, Lord, I'm not living in Lahaina. No, no, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, just a, a grim reminder, but a gracious reminder. Our lives are on a string. We're a phone call away. We want to, This promise of life is a good promise. Let it motivate you. Let it remind you that you are a pilgrim in this world. So that's the first thing, the motivation. Remember the unique gospel to which you believe. And folks, if you don't believe this, then you don't have a promise of life. And it grieves me. I always pray, Carol and I always pray when we walk around the neighborhood on Saturday, just praying, God, convict those who are too comforted and, and yet comfort with the gospel those who are convicted. Uh, okay, the second thing he does, which is just beautiful, is he encourages Timothy with all the work that God has brought into his life. He encourages Timothy in the reality of his faith. Look with me at verses three to five. He says, I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you. Now, what's, what's, what's Paul doing here? He's in prison, and he's thanking God. I, I love just the, yeah, it's, the tension in this letter is so rich for me. He's in prison, and he's thanking God. Now, what, what is he doing? I think he's encouraging Timothy in, in terms of Timothy's faith, he's saying, Timothy, I know you. You have a strong faith. Here I am. I'm constantly praying for you, day and night, he says. Now, notice that little line there when he says, I thank God that I can serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience. What's this mean? I, I think it simply means that there were, there were Jewish teachers who were saying that Paul actually had departed from the faith of Abraham. He didn't believe in the promises of God to Abraham, that he has a new religion, introducing a new thought. And he's saying, no, 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 no. No, I am preaching the same faith. Uh, Abraham was waiting for a son, a seed that would come and bring deliverance for all the people of God. Paul's preaching the same thing, just as his ancestors did, and he does it with a clear conscience. In other words, he's, not, he's in prison, but he's not guilty of some criminal act. He's in prison because he's preaching this same message. But even while in prison, he's saying to Timothy, shoulder on, persevere. I'm praying for you day and night. I mean, you know how that feels when someone says, I've really been praying for you. You're in a tough patch. And someone says, here's how I'm praying for you. And they send you a text. I mean, aren't you drawn to be encouraged by that? Doesn't it kind of bolster you? Doesn't it kind of motivate you to finish well? That's what he's doing here. And then he goes on to say, Timothy, I know all about you. Now, Timothy probably came to faith through Paul's ministry in Acts chapter 14, the first time Paul went as a missionary through Lystra. And then, and then in Acts 16, Paul comes back through a second time, and that's when he probably took Timothy as a disciple with him to begin this ministry, that they would be together for, as I said, 15 years together. And, and what he says about Timothy is, I've seen God's spirit in you. I've seen God change you. 
In 1 Corinthians 4, he calls Timothy a dear child in the faith. In Romans 16, he calls Timothy a fellow worker. In 1 Thessalonians 4, he says that you're my brother and you're God's fellow worker. And listen to what he says in Philippians 2. He says, I have no one like him who would be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. This is a man who has grown up in the faith. He's still a young man. But Paul's encouraging him. Look at the work of God in your life. We, We need that kind of encouragement from one another. This is what I'm seeing God do in your life. And that's what Paul's bringing to Timothy to encourage him. But then Paul shifts from his own influence in Timothy's life, and he talks about his family, grandmother Lois and mother Eunice. And notice what he says. He says this, I'm reminded of your sincere faith. So Paul sees a genuine, real faith in Timothy, and he says, it first dwelt in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice. Notice how he, how he describes faith. A lot of times we, we think of faith as kind of this you know, abstract kind of just belief, but it can dwell in people. It dwelt in your grandmother, Lois. Faith is not this cognitive set of propositions alone. Faith is active, it lives within us, and it begins to change our life. We move away from shading the truth for our benefit to telling the truth. We move away from temptation to lust to fighting it in greater measure. We turn away from kind of this this hoarding mentality becoming more generous. It dwells within us. And what he's saying to Timothy, you saw it both, you heard it from them, but you saw it in them. So the reality of the faith that you have, you saw it played out right there. He's just encouraging them with these various influences in life. So, so how, do we, how do we do this? I mean, how does this motivate us? What ought we to be doing to persevere? Well, folks, we need friends. I mean, we need this kind of friendship, the spiritual friendship that Paul had with Timothy. Uh, what characterizes the friendships that you have in this church? Uh, what marks them as unique? Who are your spiritual fathers or mothers? Uh, who is praying for you? Or who's, who's exercising love towards you? You know, whose life are you looking at and being drawn and encouraged by? You know, Paul says in chapter 3, verse 10 of the same letter, he says, you know all about my teaching and my way of life. You know about my teaching, so, you know, the, the doctrine and the truth that is being taught but, but you know my, my way of life. You know, what he's calling for here is this life-on-life discipleship. We all need it. I mean, this is a means of grace. I try to display some of my own struggles in life from the pulpit so you can see my teaching and my life. That's why we believe in a pastoral ministry here that is very much with people and, and not kind of distant and set apart like a CEO model of church. We want you to know us, but we want you to know each other. Who do you know? Who are you pursuing? Uh, Let me just encourage you that I don't think we can persevere as this letter is intending to do apart from this kind of influence, this kind of friendship. Uh, And and maybe you've been in the faith a long time. I, I would say then, who is your Timothy? Who are you coming alongside and spending time with, sharing both the truth of God but also your life of God? You know, it says in Hebrews chapter 10, let us encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. I I can't emphasize this kind of spiritual friendship enough. Uh, Augustine knew it in the fourth century. He says, in this world, two things are essential, life and friendship. Both should be highly prized and we must not undervalue either one. Come all the way to C.S. Lewis. Friendship is the greatest of worldly goods. Certainly to me, it's the chief happiness of life. I think we need friendship more often than we need counseling. Uh, One pastor made this comment. He said, one of my most frequent observations in ministry is that younger married couples, as an example, who think they need counseling more often simply need to sit around a dinner table with an older faithful married couple once or twice a month to hear stories of perseverance, love, humility, self-sacrifice, evidence that they can make it. Now, there's obviously a place of counseling in the life of the church, but But watching another person live is really essential. 
I mean, it's, it's really important to see, how did you handle that? We know the situations aren't exactly the same, but boy, there's a lot of growth that can be had by just us bringing people into our lives and, and kind of revealing ourselves, having them reveal their own, and just moving together in this thing called the Christian pilgrimage. But it's not just spiritual friendships. There's also the family influence that plays a role in persevering us. Uh, notice that he speaks about Lois and Eunice, the mother and grandmother. You know, it, it's amazing to me when I think about this. Modern psychology says, listen, parental influence is, is helpful, but it's not necessary. Really? I, I mean, mothers and fathers not having an, an, an intentional exerting influence on people? I mean, think about the role that the, the mother had. I, I bet... If, I were to, if you're a Christian here, I bet you 90% of you would say yes to this question. Did your mother play an important role in your spiritual development? I mean, I mean, the bulk, the vast majority would say absolutely. I realize some of you may not have had that. You may have come from non-Christian homes where mother and father were not. But many of you, the, the, the role of mothers is so primary. But father is the same. I mean, many fathers will say, well, you know, my wife knows the scriptures more and she's better with the kids. Let me say, don't take an easy pass on that. Ephesians 6, 4, he says, fathers, don't exasperate your children, but train them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. The Greek word he uses for fathers is not parents there, it's fathers. It, it's a both, it's a both and. But I want you to see the power of the Christian message isn't located just in having to have a father and mother. If you have a father and mother who are believing and influencing, then that is fantastic. But notice there's no mention of a father here. So it's the mother and the grandmother. There's no mention of Timothy's father. You do hear him in scripture in Romans 16, 1, but he's just a Greek. And what that means is he's just a Gentile. He's not a Christian. So you see, even in spiritually mixed marriages, the Christian influence is significant. Uh, there's a great you know, PDF by um, um, Ryle. Um, oh boy, it's when the names go, it is painful, isn't it? <laughs> I've only read about 100 of his books. Anyways, Ryle, just type in Ryle, Duties of Parents. And it is incredible, uh, the wisdom. I would read that thing every year when my kids were still at home. And um, so it's a great book for both moms and dads. But I want you to see, speaking not just to the family influence, I want you to see that even in spiritually mixed marriages, the Christian message still has power. But notice the word of grandparents. Now, the grand grandfather wasn't mentioned. Just the grandmother, Lois. I know uh, I have seven grandchildren, and, uh, and I don't see our role as simply spoiling them, although that is a lot of fun, no doubt. But uh, I see the role different. I, I see that we are to be instructional to them regarding the faith, but it's important for us to live it out and finish life well for them, that they can see a faithful grandfather and grandmother uh, who love the Lord, who serve in the church, who are faithful to the end. And my grandkids have, both sets are trying to do that well. This is a call to us. But I would even say it's a call to those who are younger. For the students here, you who are still at home. You know, do you see the role? Your parents are drawing you to church. I know many of you, you don't want to go to church. We know that. Your parents know that. And you know that. And we know that. But I have too many people 30 and 35 come back to me and say, I wish I listened more to my parents. They had to go their own way, and then they had this train, you know, just these, these containers of regret because they moved away. And then they're coming back in their 30s saying, I should have listened to my parents more. God has designed us to both enter the faith and persevere in the faith through parental and um, and friendship kind of influences. Okay, third thing that will help us. So, so friends, if we want to persevere, there has to be your life hitting the life of another person. So, so who is that going to be? Uh, please don't just put this off for next week, but think through if I don't have, and particularly for men here, I think I read some statistic 
uh, that like 75% of men don't have two friends. Two friends. I'm not talking acquaintances or you can jaw about the game and everything. I'm, I'm talking about real, like we're spiritually concerned for one another and we're actively engaged. So, so, so be mindful of that. Let's not let another year pass by and not move on that. Okay, the third thing we see is, of course, the Spirit of God. Remember the Spirit. Look with me at 6 and 7. In 6 and 7, he says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And this is really, this is so, um, this is so practically helpful. He says this, Timothy, he's in prison, and uh, he's saying, fan into flame the gift given to you. So the way to overcome kind of a burned out Christian life. You know, many of us uh, as Christians, you know, we kind of do the quiet quitting. You know, it's a new term now. The quiet quitting, you kind of, you don't quit outright, but you kind of just do the minimum. You, you kind of just do enough to pass by. And so a lot of Christians move into kind of a quiet quitting. And he's saying, fan into flame the gift. Now, we're not told what the gift is. We are told that it came through the laying on of hands. Now, there's a clue in that, because in 1 Timothy 4.14, he speaks about it. Let me read it for you. He says, don't neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. So what is this gift? Well, it could be the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does dwell within us. We see that in verse 14 of this same chapter. Or it could be the gift of pastoral ministry. In other words, here in chapter 4, the last uh, in 1 Timothy, it seems as if Timothy was brought up before the church. The council of elders came around him. They put their hands on him, and they prayed for him. Uh, putting our hands on people is often done it's both in the Old Testament, the priest would put his hands on the animal. It's like a, a way of symbolically showing sins being conferred to the animal that would be sacrificed rather than the people. Or Jesus puts his hands on people to heal. It, it's a way of con conferring grace. And here they put their hands on Timothy and they prayed for him because he had the gift of pastoral leadership, preaching, teaching, administration in the church. And so he's saying, fan that into flame. Fan it in a flame. He's not saying start the fire because it's burned out. No, you, you know, it's like a campfire. You want to get it going again, you kind of blow on the embers and they start to get redder. Then you put some leaves, you put some twigs or, on it, and, th and then it starts burning more. Then you put logs on He's saying fan that into flame. In other words, Timothy, use your gift. Use the gift. Don't just, there's a difference between having a gift and using a gift. They aren't the same. You're called to, you may be given one, you are given one, and you got to use it. And that's what he's saying. Use the gift. Use it by the power of the Spirit. You see that in verse 7 when he says, We have not been given a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love. What's he saying here? Well, is that spirit a little S spirit or a big S spirit? Well, I think it might be a big S spirit. And by that I mean the Holy Spirit. That you have, the Holy Spirit has not given you cause to fear. He's, been, he's given you cause to have power, to enable you to use whatever gift you have in ministry. Maybe it's being more bold with the scriptures, speaking to a neighbor. Maybe it's a spirit of love uh, that you are, you are able to unilaterally move with kindness towards another person, knowing they probably won't appreciate it or return the favor. Or a spirit of self-control. That word can also be translated sound mind, that, that you have the wisdom to know what to do. In other words, what he's saying here, Timothy, fan into flame. You need to be engaged. So friends, we come to faith and repentance in Christ by the sheer grace of God. We call it a monergistic work of God, that God moves by his spirit. He regenerates our soul. We see our need, and we receive and seek the gospel. That's justification. It's a work of God by the mercy of God. Sanctification, growing in the faith, is a, uh, it's a synergistic work. It's we participate with God. In other words, he's saying, Timothy, you have to fan into flame. You can't sit there and expect God to land upon you, but you are to engage with God now that you know God. 
Uh, Paul said the same thing in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. In other words, God's grace saved him. And his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is in me. You see that kind of that bilateral relationship. And he's saying to Timothy, you have to be engaged. Timothy, you're flagging in faith. Get back in the game. Preaching, teach, lead. I know you're tired. Move anyways. It's the both and. So it's it kind of, you're drawing the spirit into your life. Now, let me remind you here. You might not have the gift that Timothy has. But you do have a gift. Every Christian has a gift. In 1 Peter 4.10, each of us, he says, each has received a gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's grace. Whoever speaks, speak as the one who speaks with the oracles of God. Whoever serves, as the one who serves with the strength that God provides. So you do have a gift. A gift is something given to you by God by which you can extend his grace and his mercy to others. It may be teaching, it may be serving, it may be cheerfulness, it may be administration, it may be giving. It, it could be a hundred different gifts that he gives and that we use these things to extend his mercy and grace to others. You need the Holy Spirit to do this. I know right now you may be thinking, I don't think I have a gift. I think he's speaking to everybody but me. No, I'm speaking to each Christian here. You have a gift. It says it right here. I believe it. Now, you may not be using it. You may not be aware of it. Uh, let me ask you to ask someone, a spouse if you're married, a friend if you're not, or come forward to one of the staff or elders. Uh, but you have a gift. How do we use it? Because when Paul says... To persevere, you have to fan in a flame. It means you've got to use it. You've got to know it to use it. And if you don't know it, then just try something and see what happens. Remember, God has promised us a spirit. In fact, Jesus himself has said these words in Luke. He says, what father among you, if a son asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If he asks for an egg, will give him a stone? And if though you are evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So ask for the Spirit of God, that he would, he would encourage and strengthen with power, with love, with wisdom to walk out these gifts. We don't want to be quiet quitters. We want to persevere. We want to finish strong. We want to, we want to continue to be found faithful in this pilgrimage. You know, there's a scene... Um, from Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. And it's a scene, a Christian is having a dream and he's led into this house and interpreter uh, brings him into this room and there's a fire there. So Christian, remember, it's an allegory for the Christian life. And so Christian is the Christian who's brought into this room trying to understand the faith and an interpreter shows him in this room there's a fire and the fire is burning brighter and brighter and brighter even though someone is pouring water on it. And yet the fire burns brighter while water's being poured on it. And so Christian says to the interpreter, well, what does this mean? And so the interpreter uh, explains, he takes him back around behind the fire to a secret room. And he shows him in the secret room that on the other side of the fireplace, there's, there's Jesus standing with oil, kind of pouring oil onto the fire giving it more and more heat. So though the water is trying to douse out the flame, that oil is fueling it more and more. And he says, what does this mean? And the oil, of course, is the grace of God, the very grace of God that he pours into us as we fan our gifts into flame, that it keeps us persevering in the difficulty of this life. So folks, we all have the temptation. Uh, in pastoral ministry, the temptation is to quit. In, in the life of the saint, there's always the temptation to just go into a, a quiet quitting. I'm just going to play it soft. I'm going to play it easy. I'm going to keep my head down low. And he say, no. We're being instructed by a man who's about to die. We're being instructed by a man who has labored diligently. It, it's really a word for all of us. We, we want to we persevere. Do you remember the unique nature of the gospel? Let's think about that this week. Uh, do you have people in your life who are encouraging you so that when you flag in faith, they come along? 
And, and are you asking God for his spirit? I mean, ask him. Say, would you fill me? I, I did yesterday. I was doing something I didn't want to do. I was called to do it. I had a lousy attitude. And I said, God, you have got to help me by your spirit. Love this opportunity to serve. Didn't want to do it. I told him. I said, you've got to give me the spirit to do it. So, so appeal to him for that. He knows you can do nothing apart from him. He just wants you to come to him. Let's take a moment and ask God for grace and wisdom to walk this out. And I'll pray for us in just a minute. Father, thank you for the clear voice you have given to us today, instructed by a saint of old, not just for Timothy, but for us to persevere, to, to consider the glory of your gospel. Now, Father, the, there is the promise of life. Father, inflame our hearts with joy, so much joy that we can, like Paul, even say, I'd rather depart so that I can be with you. But on your account, I'll remain. Now, Father, help us to find our, our, our eyes increasing focus, not to leave this world prematurely, but to long for that promised life that is found only in Christ Jesus. As Let me pray, there's no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And, and, and Father, give to us a, a hunger for friendships. We need friends. And many of us don't have them, Lord, would you, even those who are inhibited and bashful and shy, would you grant to us grace to even see this week maybe some friendships begin to form, friendships uh, that would be for our spiritual good. And Father, would you grant to us the gift of your spirit, we ask. Father, I ask on behalf of this church and myself included, you tell us we as parents love to give good gifts to our children. So we trust you that you'll give us the 